Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. One of the things that I think about a ton and I am super passionate about is company culture. And culture to me is one of these things that is, it doesn't happen on its own and it must be a leadership priority throughout the entire organization. You have to have a nucleus. You have to have everybody on the same page as to why we're doing what we're doing and how we're doing it. You know, it's one thing to say, we're gonna hire an engineer to come and write code. It's another thing to say, hey, we're going to hire an engineer who comes to write code and also has a draw, has a connection to the users that we get to do our work for every day. Hey, everyone, that was Larry Hip, the CEO of Brightwell, and this is episode 162 of the Leaders in Payments podcast, and I'm your host, Greg Myers. Larry has had a fascinating journey throughout the fintech space and has a genuine passion for seeing people succeed and places a tremendous amount of intention and importance on the resiliency that a strong company culture can provide. Brightwell is a fintech company that grew up in the prepaid industry. They cater predominantly to the cruise ship market by providing prepaid cards for employee payroll. Post-pandemic, they are going strong and have expanded their product suite into cross-border payments. Larry and I also talk about where he sees the industry going in the next two to three years, including a predicted consolidation throughout the fintech space, as well as how blockchain will change our industry significantly. We've got a great episode ahead, so let's get started. Hi, Larry. Thank you for being here, and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. Hey, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I'm looking forward to it. Great. So let's dive right in, and we'll talk a little bit about your professional background in a few minutes, but tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, where you went to school, where you currently live, a few things like that. Sure. So I was born in Texas, grew up in Alabama. I met my wife at the University of Auburn, where I completed my undergrad. From there, we have lived both in Alabama, Tampa for many years, and have been here in Atlanta for the last eight years. Okay, great. And as we talked a little before, I am an Auburn man as well, so I have to say War Eagle. It's only fair. Yes, sir, War Eagle. <laughs> All right, well, let's dive in and talk about the company Brightwell. So tell us what Brightwell does. So Brightwell is a fintech company based here in Atlanta. We grew up in the prepaid industry, and the company is about 11 years old at this point. And early in its days, we found our way onto cruise ships and using prepaid cards for payroll on cruise ships. So if you think about a cruise ship, especially if you roll the clock back about six, seven years ago, many of those ships were paying people in cash on board. And so come payday, you would have just a huge line of people that are standing there getting paid down to the penny on payday. And early on in life, what we were able to do was really turn that into a digital payroll system where instead of getting paid in cash, you would get paid to a prepaid card. And, you know, if you're sitting there in the middle of the ocean and you got a bunch of cash in your hand, it was really hard to do anything with it anyway. And so that transformation from cash to digital was huge for that industry. And beyond that, we started for six, seven years ago now, what we could do to build the best fintech app for people working on cruise ships, where when they got paid, their money would land into the Brightwell app, and then we would help them get that money all around the world. And if you were to look at a cruise ship by a demographics, it is one of the most diverse populations of people working in one place that you're going to find. We send money around the world with our Navigator product to just about every country on the planet that the federal government will allow. And that's how diverse the population of people on ships are. And it's been really rewarding to grow up in that industry. And it's really propelled us forward to kind of some things that we're going to be doing next as well. Okay, so are you currently still just in the cruise ship space? No, so, you know, cruise ships, you're going to hear, hey, Larry, you're cruise ships and 
We just went through this thing called the pandemic, and that was a wild time for us. And so if you think back into March of 2020, March of 2020 comes around, the whole world is starting to go into chaos a little bit, and uh, cruise ships across the globe just shut down. And it was a wild ride. You got all these people on board. We're deeply connected to the mission of helping people with their money and making sure their money gets back home to their families. And the next thing you know, all of these people are scattered back to their homes all around the world and cruise ships essentially come to a stop. And we go through a lot of dark times there, like many companies, when you go through that pandemic, when all of a sudden revenue goes down to near zero. But we held on and we persevered. And one of the things that we were able to do during that time frame was really work on ourselves, look at our corporate strategy, figure out where we wanted to go, quote unquote, next, and do it with our teams that would normally be focused 100% and all this time on our other product, but now had the opportunity to kind of look towards the future. And when we really started to dissect who we were as a company and what we do, Certainly, payroll for cruise ships has defined us and is still our home for what we do today. But when you peel back the layers of that onion, we're really a cross-border payments company. That's what we do every day. We have payroll that comes in from the cruise lines. And the number one thing that we do with that payroll is help people get that money back home to their families. And so while we were kind of down in the pandemic, we went to task to building some new stuff. And one of those things that we built is a new product that we're launching commercially. Actually, right now, we started in January of 2020, launching it commercially. And it's called Ready Remit. And it allows us to take our APIs and the SDKs that we've built that we use every day to move money around the globe and offer that to other fintech companies and let them jump into that cross-border game. And we take over the compliance burden for you. Moving money across the world is a very compliant industry, and we're on a mission now to try and make that simple and really change the name for Brightwell of being a cross-border payments company just as much as a cruise payroll company. Okay. And do you go to market through sort of a a direct sales force to sign up these cruise lines and other companies, or do you have partners that you work through, or is it a little bit of both? A little bit of both. You know, right now we've got some great partnerships with cross-border payment providers like MasterCard cross-border services that we're using. And we are right now launching through some of our partners that we already have. You know, one of the unique things about Brightwell and our app that we have is we have connected many of the country's best money movers all underneath one roof. So if you think about companies like Western Union, MoneyGram, TransPay, which is now part of MasterCard, Cambridge, we've brought and understand the APIs and the way all of the compliance team for all of those companies move money. And that's given us an opportunity to work with them to say, hey, how do we help you grow your business while we're also at the same time out there selling directly to people who need the service that we've got? Okay. And you mentioned the fraud part or the compliance part? Was that the Arden product? Yeah. So if the pandemic wasn't crazy enough for you, as far as being a company really entangled into the cruise industry, in April, we had a huge issue happen where we woke up one morning and about $2.7 million had been taken from our cardholders. And it wasn't a security breach. It wasn't a hack. It wasn't anything that even affected or touched our computer code. It was what's called an enumeration attack. And that enumeration attack is when a fraudster on a card program starts to just process brute force style every single combination of card number, CVV, and PIN number until they find a hit. And the fraudsters that day threw hundreds of millions of transactions our way. And what they were doing is, is just when they would just test, 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 they find a successful card where they found like kind of the pieces to the puzzle for the whole card. And then they would just drain the card down to zero. And, you know, it was one of these things where we were one of, I think I have discovered about 12 issuers of cards that were affected that day across the globe. I mean, there was a conference call when that happened. And there's people from here to Gibraltar to the UK, I mean, all over the globe. And we're trying to figure out what just happened. And the reality is we, after that, went to task trying to figure out how do we mitigate that risk? 
how do I make sure this never happens again for us or our users? Can you imagine you're sitting there, you're on a cruise ship, you're now being told that your job is probably putting on hold, you're on your way home, you're on your way back to the Philippines, Indonesia, wherever home is. And then all of a sudden you look in your account and you've had a, your money's gone. I mean, this was a risk for us that wasn't just financial for us, but we wanted to make sure this never happened for our users again. And the short version of how we built the product now called Arden is we spent six, seven months trying to find something to buy that would mitigate this risk for us. We couldn't find it. And what do good fintechs do when they find a payments problem? We built some software ourselves. We've called that product Arden, and it is one of the kind of two new things that were coming out of COVID launching. One of the additions to our company is the ability to do payment security and really watch card transactions, watch cross-border transactions from a fraud perspective. We're on a mission to get our chargeback line down to zero, and we're really, really close by some software and an intelligence that we've put into our, our ecosystem and are now working with other partners of issuer cards to help them as well. Okay. Do you physically issue cards or just is it all digital through an app? So we do both. Most of our cards are physical. If you go back to the cruise product as an example, we give all of those crew members our app and give them a Visa card. If you're in the US and a MasterCard, if you're in Europe, and when you get paid, that money lands into your Brightwell account. You've got a card attached to it. And, you know, we look like a bank and feel like a bank. And if you look into our app, you see your balance, your transactions and everything that you would expect to see there. Okay. Well, what would you say differentiates your company from your competitors out there? So one of the things that we've been able to do that is really different from our competitors is we over the years have brought together all of the money movers underneath one app. I'm sure most people are familiar with Expedia, any of the aggregators of travel that are on the internet these days. And that's kind of what we've been able to do for cross-border payments inside of our app and our APIs. Because we've done Western Union, we've done MoneyGram, we've done them all. And what we've been able to do is understand how all of those APIs work as far as money movement around the world goes. And we've been able to start consolidating that down into one easy to use interface that gets you access to all of those where we take the messiness that is understanding all of their APIs and translating it into something that's easy for someone else to consume. We've done a lot of hard work connecting one by one by one by one rail. And to our knowledge, it separates us tremendously because we believe we've got more cross-border payment connections underneath one roof than anybody else. And now we're on a mission to just make it really simple and easy for other fintechs like us to get access to those on a one-stop shopping instead of having to do those integrations that took us so many years to build out. Okay. Do you charge a SaaS fee or just transaction fees? Yeah, for the most part, it's transaction fees. This is an industry where Most people in the cross-border game, it's a transactional-based business. Our Arden product, the security product, is a little bit more of a platform fee that hits every month for the service. But for the most part, our business is a transactional revenue business. Okay. And where do you see this industry heading? And we could talk about the three products or the three products as a whole, but where do you see that headed in the next two to three years? Yeah, the next two to three years, I think it's going to be really, really interesting. There are a tremendous amount of fintechs in the world right now, and I think we're going to see a lot of consolidation. I think we're going to see the fintechs emerging as their specialty. We, for example, we're cross-border specialty. Someone else is going to have a specialty in KYC. Others are having specialties in merchant acquiring. And there's a tremendous amount of innovation happening, and it's great to see. It's moving fast. You know, in the Fiserv's of the world, the FIS's of the world, we know them, we love them. They're the big pioneers and giants that are out there. I think you're going to see some of these fintechs starting to kind of bolt on together to start creating new versions of Fiserv, new versions of FIS, where it won't be the giant players that we have today or the, or the only place you can go to get one-stop shopping for everything. I think we're going to see a lot of consolidation in the fintech space. I also think it might sound a little cliche, 
But I think everything is going to consistently in the short term get faster and cheaper, more transparent, you know, faster real time payments is a huge thing right now. And it's what people want. People are now used to things just happening automatically. And when it comes to any type of payment, I think we're going to see just this continual push on speed and transparency in our neck of the woods where you have cross-border payments happening. And there's a tremendous focus by the World Health Organization for better transparency in how a payment flows and the pricing and the fees when money is moving around the world and to make it faster. You know, there are still some countries in the world where it takes five, six days for money to get into that part of the world. And I think in the short term, when we look at payments, I think the name of the game is still cheaper, faster, quicker, more transparent. Do you get a demand for crypto at all? You know, I think if you look beyond the short term, there's a ton of advertising right now on crypto and we follow it pretty quickly. Right now, we're watching it. We're doing some experimentation. We've got some R&D stuff that we're working through. What's really interesting about crypto in kind of, what are we, April of 2022 here is the landscape seems to shift and change about every three, four months. What was really emerging kind of in December is already starting to shift to a little bit something new right now. And it's exciting. It's fun. If you've been around the payments game for a long time, understanding how crypto works and, you know, kind of the transformation that we're going to see in the industry over five, eight, 10 years out. This is around to stay. There's enough velocity behind the work that's being had here that something's going to shake out. And I think really the blockchain tech underneath all that is what's going to change the industry. And if you start acknowledging like there's different types of blockchains and the speed of them, we're just now starting to see today blockchain technology that compete with Visa or a MasterCard at a transactions per second level. And I think that technology is still just going to accelerate and grow exponentially over the next five to 10 years. So beyond where we are today, yeah, crypto is in everybody's mind. What the tech is really going to be that weighs out, say, over the next 10 years, I think it's still in discovery mode right now. It's hard to predict what's going to win in the long run, but I think the blockchain technology is here to stay. And I think 10 years from now, it'll be as ambiguous as, you know, a debit card in your wallet and tap to pay and all the things that we just kind of see as norms today when it comes to making payments. 10 years from now, the blockchain will be one of those things, in my opinion. Yeah, that's the sentiment I hear from a a lot of people is exactly that. Well, if you don't mind, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about you. Tell us about your journey, your, your career, your background and how you got to be the CEO there. So I uh, classically trained, I'm a software engineer, left Auburn when I graduated and started writing banking software. Nothing too crazy. I wrote check imaging software out of school and really just found a niche and a love of payments and entrepreneurship. Went on from check imaging software to doing clearinghouse software, kind of exchanging bank files at the end of the day, trying to clear cheaper and faster instead of sending everything straight to the Federal Reserve. I did a tour of duty, so to speak, at Raymond James doing stocks and bonds. And for the last six, seven years here now have been with Brightwell doing banking, neobanking. We like to say we were a neobank before neobank was a cool thing to say, and then moving money across borders. And right as the pandemic hit for us, we as a company largely driven by cruise ships at this point, we, like many companies, had to make some hard cuts. And it was a day that was probably one of the hardest days of my professional career where we had no idea when cruise ships were coming back up. And we all were trying to figure out how much cash we had and when we were, how long we could last, you know, and will the cruise ships be down for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? And when it became apparent that this thing was going to go the distance, we, like many companies, had to cut costs and people's jobs were part of those costs. And on that day, when we did that, there was an opportunity for me to step into the CEO role right here at Brightwell. And uh, that was two years ago tomorrow. I will have been the CEO of Brightwell. And it has been one of the hardest jobs of my career. 
managing a business through one of the worst financial times in modern history, also being one of the most rewarding things that I've been able to do in my career. You know, after that day that we had to cut some staff and then I turned over and became the CEO, I remember that day and I remember talking to the staff and saying, okay, that's it. We're not doing this again. And we're going to work together. We're going to band together. We're going to get on the other side of this thing and we're going to manage the business really, really well. And I'm really proud to say we made it. And it wasn't without sacrifice across the board. You know, a lot of our folks coming together, committing to being a part of our team and committing to doing a lot with a little. And it was super, super rewarding to be a part of the team when we went through that. One of the kind of monikers that I look at that I'm really, really proud of is pre-pandemic, we were on the Atlanta top places to work list. And through the pandemic, not only were we able to stay on that list year over year, but we also increased in our ranking. And, you know, I think that was a that was just a symbol, a sign of that CEO journey and helping us as an organization. It's not about me as the CEO. I certainly don't set the culture. I certainly don't set the tone every day. It's our leaders that work with me and everybody in our company. But the fact that we were able to steer through that thing, come out the other side as a stronger, better company, it's been one of the most rewarding things. And having the opportunity to be the CEO of Brightwell through that time period is something that I'm really grateful for. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating given the challenges that everyone had during that time that you guys were able to focus on that business segment that is uh, that, that was obviously very challenged. So congratulations on that. Yeah, it wasn't easy. But we've got an amazing team of people. And, you know, I talk with our staff these days and, you know, many of them have heard me say this before. Two years from now, when this whole thing's behind us and we're growing again and we're moving and we're shaking and we're doing big things and FinCup landscapes, you know, there's going to be a group of people that have a, a chapter in the Brightwell book together that went through that time period. And that group of humans that works at Brightwell now and through the pandemic they're going to have a special bond forever because we made it on the other side and came out stronger than when we began. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, what are some things you're passionate about? So maybe one business related passion and one personal passion. So business related passion. One of the things that I think about a ton and I am super passionate about is company culture and culture to me is one of these things that is it doesn't happen on its own, and it must be a leadership priority throughout the entire organization. You have to have a nucleus. You have to have everybody on the same page as to why we're doing what we're doing and how we're doing it. You know, it's one thing to say we're going to hire an engineer to come and write code. It's another thing to say, hey, we're going to hire an engineer who comes to write code and also has a draw, has a connection to the users that we get to do our work for every day. And it's like, hey, you may be excellent at your job, but also tell me, hey, we've got a real passion for making sure that our users have financial freedom, financial education. We make it easy for them to use their money as it is for us to use ours through ACH and easy US banking systems. And when you find people to work with that come in with that extra connection around what you're doing, you build a culture that is bigger and better than just getting the work done. Because when something goes bump in the night, and it evidently does, always does, you're not asking people to, hey, I need you to work a little extra tonight. You've got an entire group of people that are like, hey, somebody right now is not getting access to their money. Like I would want access to my money and we got to go and we got to make that better for them. And that culture that we've been able to build, you know, when we think about things like core values and what we do as an organization, we work really, really hard to make sure everybody knows all of those things and are deeply connected with those things. And for me, you know, there's a great book out there, good to great, classic reading. And there's a line in there that I'll paraphrase here because I don't know it exactly quote for quote, 
But if you can take an entire organization and get them rowing in the same direction at the same time, you can put that group of people up against any competitor, big or small, and they will become victorious on the other side because they're connected to something bigger than just writing code, doing customer service, the finance that happens behind the scenes. No, they're all brought together. And for me, as far as business goes, I am super passionate about building a business that rose in that direction correctly, because I think it's resilient no matter what is thrown at it. And I think if you look at, hey, we made it on the other side of a pandemic and we improved our ranking as one of the top places to work. Hey, we're on the right path there. There's always work to be done. I'm passionate about learning how to do it better, more keeping up with the modern day times of how culture works and really, really passionate about building business from that perspective. Okay. Personal passion. Personal, you know, I got to tell you, I am in that phase of life right now where I have three kids that are all emerging teenagers. I got 15, 13, and 10, and they're at a fun time of life where most things revolve around them. And one of the things that I'm super passionate about right now is we all work hard. We all work probably too much than we should here in the States. And one of the things I'm really passionate about is an intentional time with my family and my children. They're going to be out of my house here in five, six years. And how do we, my wife and I as a family unit, build lifelong connections for them is probably where I spend almost all of my non-work brain power these days. And, you know, it's about putting memories in that bank of knowledge for them, exposing them to things. It's just a fun time of parenting and life. And if you know anybody or have children yourself at that age, you're just kind of always on the move. So it's kind of hard to focus on you anyway, because there's always a practice to get to somewhere. Yep. Yep. I have a, uh, a 17 year old at home, so I, uh, I can feel the pain. But yeah, that's a lot of fun. So the next question, kind of a good segue from that, because you talk about they'll be gone soon. Well, let's assume they go to college or they start a career and they want to go into payments. And if you've been in this space a long time, you know that there's a lot of investment. There's a lot of money. FinTech is such a a hot place to work. If your kids or any kid wants to start a career in payments, what would you tell them they need to do to be successful? Wow. You know, the payments landscape is so huge. I think there's something there for everyone. You think about payments and oftentimes it's money and it's a system and engineering. But, you know, there's so much more in this industry that happens that is, take fraud as an example, right? You're in criminal justice right now in college and you're coming out. There is an entire field for you that is compliance, that is security, that is the aspects of payments that are BSA and AML. There's just something for everybody in here. You could be a psychology major. You could be anything that you're getting trained in right now in school applies to some ecosystem inside of the payments field. And I would say find your niche and jump in and find a company big or small. I'm drawn to fintech entrepreneurial type companies. That's just my my DNA. But jump in and you don't have to think about it as I have to do payments. I think you can think about it as payments is a huge wide field that can take just about every discipline and needs just about every discipline to be successful. Yeah, I think that's good advice. So Larry, we've covered a lot of ground about the company Brightwell and your vision of where the industry is headed and your background. Is there anything else you want to cover before we wrap up? Oh, you know, it's an exciting time. And there's so many things that I see coming here in the few years. It's a fun industry to be in. And I was just really happy to join your show today. Well, what would be the best way people could learn more about the company? Certainly. We've got a website, brightwell.com. You can learn all about our products there, who we are as a company, and easy ways to get in touch with us, brightwell.com. Okay, great. Well, Larry, thank you so much for being on the show today. I know your time is very valuable, so thank you for being here. No problem. Thank you. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well. 